Hi, and welcome to this Monday edition of Focal Point on AFR Talk, a brand new week of broadcasting here on the home of muscular Christianity on Conservative Talk Radio. The program is Focal Point. The network is AFR Talk, the American Family Radio Talk Network. Great to have you in the conversation today. we got a lot we are going to get to today, so we are glad that you are with us. We want to begin, as we customarily do, especially after this Thanksgiving weekend where we have as a nation turned our attention to God and to giving him thanks for what he has offered to us to focus our attention on him. I hope you had a great and restful Thanksgiving weekend that you took time to spend with your family, with your friends, but also time spent thanking God for his generosity, his goodness, his blessings, and his favor to us. Now, in the book of Isaiah, which is where my reading has been, uh, Isaiah goes back and forth between words of sober warning as well as words of hope. It's one of the reasons why we never ought to give up hope as believers is because we are in contact with the God of the impossible. Came across a quote from John Knox this week, a man with God is always in the majority. A man with God is always in the majority. So we never need fret, we never need fear, we never need give up when it seems from a human standpoint that we are outnumbered. Remember what God showed uh, Elisha, there are more that are with us than those who are with them. So it's always important to remind ourselves that when we are connected to God, we are connected to his larger purposes. He has a purpose, and in the end, in the end, it is his will that is going to be done. And the only question, are we going to be a part of cooperating with him and seeing that his will is done? Are we going to be a part of those who are resisting and obstructing the carrying out of his will? Now, Isaiah begins this way in the section I pondered this morning in Isaiah chapter 30. This is a great word. Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. And therefore, he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. So the Lord waits to be gracious to us, which indicates that God has a timing there. He may not always extend his grace in a way that's manifest or that we can feel or perceive or feel in our timetable. Rarely does that. As I often told my uh, congregation when I pastored, God is seldom early, but never late. So he sometimes waits to be gracious to us. He, he will wait longer than we want him to wait. We will wait longer than we would wait if we were him, which is why he's him and we're not. But he waits to be gracious to us. If he is waiting, it's only because, because he has a greater measure of grace he is going to extend and bestow and uh, he says, blessed, therefore, are those who wait for him. You know, one of the problems we have as, as Christians is we don't wait. Uh, we don't wait. We don't persevere. We don't have patience. I was talking on a left-wing radio program last week about why the homosexual lobby won at the ballot box in four different states. And I said it's because they never give up. They never quit. They're determined. They have resolution. They they have a goal, and they are determined to stick to it until they achieve it. And the problem with Christians is when it comes to an election, we win and we go home. We lose and we go home. We win and we think everything's going to be okay, and so we become complacent about what's going on in the larger culture. If we lose, you figure, out ah, what's the use, and we go home and quit. And Isaiah says, no, blessed are those who wait for him. Way too soon for us to think about giving up the battle for our culture. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. As soon as he hears it, he answers you. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher will not hide himself anymore, but your eyes shall see your teacher and your ear shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. So he says, look, when there are times of adversity, when we have to drink the water of affliction, God has a purpose in that, and that's a time for us to maintain our attentiveness to God, our focus on God, because he will speak to us. Isaiah says, look, God will speak to you through his spirit, and he will say to you, this is the way, 
walk in it. And God will come and avenge himself against his enemies, against the enemies of his people. Here's verse 27. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger, and in thick rising smoke, his breath is like an overflowing stream that reaches up to the neck to sift the nations with the sieve of destruction and to place on the jaws of the people peoples a bridle that leads astray. So he says, look, God has the capacity with a brandished arm to fight with us, to fight for us against all of our enemies, our spiritual enemies in the unseen world and the enemies of our people. And therefore, he says, it's, it, it, it's foolish for you to depend upon the arm of the flesh in fighting uh, your battles rather than looking to the Holy One of Israel or consulting with the Lord. That's the place where hope and help is going to come from. Like birds hovering, so the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem. He will protect it and deliver it. He will spare it and rescue it. Turn to him from whom people have deeply revolted, O children of Israel. So once again, it is time for us to turn to the Lord and trust in his mighty arm. Well, let's go to prayer based on this passage of Scripture. Lord God, we bring our city and our nation before you this day. We thank you that you long to be gracious to us, that you rise to show us compassion. We claim your promise that you are a God of justice and that you bless all those who wait for you. We thank you that you are gracious to us when we cry for help and that as soon as you hear our prayers, you will answer. Where you have given us the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, we pray that you will bind up our bruises and heal the wounds you have inflicted. May streams of water flow on every high mountain and every lofty hill. May the moon shine like the sun and may the sunlight be seven times brighter like the light of seven full days. We pray that you will cause us as a people to return to you. We pray that the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed and the ears of those who hear will listen. May the mind of the rash know and understand and the stammering tongue be fluent and clear. We pray that the fool will no longer be called noble nor the scoundrel highly respected. Instead, may noble men make noble plans and may their noble deeds cause them to stand. We pray that each one of us will be like a shelter from the wind for others and a refuge from the storm. May we be like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. We pray that those who spread error concerning you will be revealed as fools who speak folly, exposed as those who leave empty the hungry and withhold water from the thirsty. May those who are teachers of truth be hidden no more, but be seen by everyone. Whether we turn to the right or to the left, may our ears hear your voice and the voice of your teacher saying, this is the way, walk in it. We pray that you will remove our complacency and our false sense of security and pour out your spirit upon us from on high. May the desert become a fertile field and the fertile field seem like a forest and become places where justice and righteousness dwell. We pray that the fruit of your righteousness will be peace and that its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.